Okay, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be able to be here as part of Digicon and be able to talk to you about Scala Free and Implicit. So I have been a Scala developer for five years now. And right now I can say that I like Scala. I enjoy Scala and I like writing it every day. It's a pleasure. However, the beginnings, they weren't so smooth. I had a hard time understanding various Scala concepts and one of the things that confused me the most was implicit. So there were times when I thought, okay, I got this, I understand implicit. But then a couple of days later, maybe I stumbled across some other use of implicit and I was lost again. So I had to go back to my more experienced colleagues and tell them, okay, I know we have talked about this, but can you please explain it to me one more time? What happens here in this context? Fortunately, my colleagues were very patient. So I got through this difficult phase and I didn't give up Scala altogether. But I kept thinking, why does it have to be so difficult? There must be a better way. So when I heard about Scala Free, and when I heard that in Scala Free the concept of implicit was going to be completely redesigned, I got curious. I wanted to know if maybe that's the better way. And this is how this presentation came to be. I would like to share with you today what I have learned. So the plan for the next 40 minutes is at first, I will explain what implicits are, what problems they solve for, for us, why do we need them, why they are so difficult, and then the main part of my presentation will be seven use cases where I will show the Scala code, Scala 2 and Scala 3 back to back to explain the differences of how we used to be solving some problems in Scala 2 and how we will continue to do it in Scala 3. And then I will finish by saying a couple of words about migration. And if you have any questions, please do ask them in Slido. I will answer them at the end. So implicit in Scala, what are we talking about here? Implicit is a keyword in Scala which can mean various different things and can be used to achieve many different goals. But what's common between them is that they define some kind of contextual abstraction. So your code does not run in void, it runs in some context, and because of that, you don't have to specify everything explicitly. You can just let the compiler infer some of the things from the context and from the types. So that's why it's called contextual abstractions, abstracting over, over your context. And apart from providing context, you can use implicits to add functionality to your existing types, to define type classes, which in itself are a very powerful feature, to provide implicit conversions between the types, to solve the problem of dependency injection, and to express capabilities, compute new types, and prove relationships to the compiler between the types. So that's already a lot. It's a powerful feature, it's widely used in Scala, and it's also often this uh, magic thing that you need to let the code be what you really want, needed to do. However, it's not without its problems. So one thing is that one keyword can mean different things, and we have seen. The other problem is that it can be attached to various language parts. So we can have an implicit parameter, argument, value object, method or dev, and class. And it's not like they map one-to-one -to, -one to the cases that I have shown on the previous slide. If you have, for example, an implicit value, then you don't know if you are defining a type conversion or maybe a type class because you have to read more of the code. You, has, you have to see more of the context, you have to know the patterns and the idioms of the language to see what is really being defined here. So that's one of the reasons why it's confusing. Another reason, if you have ever written Scala code with implicits, and to me this has happened a lot of times, 
It might have happened that you had some piece of code, it was fine, it was working, and then you copy a bit of it to another class, and then it doesn't compile anymore. Why? It's the same code. But often the problem is with implicits, because maybe there in, the, in your base class, in your base file, you had a long list of implicits, and somewhere there was hidden an implicit, an implicit import, which brought to you something from the scope that one of the methods needed. It's not needed there. And when you find which import it is, and you copy it to your new place, then finally, as if magically, it works. The compiler is happy. So it's almost as you have this implicit import incantations, which you have to know, and then your compiler is happy. This was confusing. And then another thing, another problem is kind of the opposite, and it is sneaky conversions. Because sometimes in this long list of imports, you also could have imported too much. You could have imported implicit conversion into scope, which means that for your compiler, some of the types are treated as some other types. And then you're confused and you don't know why it compiles or works this specific way. So this whole set of issues was one of the reasons why Scala can sometimes be considered difficult. You can hear that it's a difficult language, that it's hard to learn, hard to understand, and it's not entirely wrong. So where does Scala Free come here? What does it bring to the table? So generally, Scala Free is a major language rewrite. It actually took eight years from the first commit to the final release. And during those eight years, what's awesome in my opinion and what's crucial is that the creators of the language, they have decided to listen closely to what we say. They have seen how the language is used, what works, what doesn't work, what is confusing for people, what is the cause of frustration. And they have decided that Scala Free will be a language which is easier to use, which just makes your everyday life writing Scala, Scala a better experience. They have decided to address and to find the main pain points. So by now, it's probably not a surprise that implicits have been selected as one of such pain points. And in Scala Free, the concept of implicits is redesigned so much that the implicit keyword is actually gone. You won't find it in Scala Free anywhere. And what you get instead is you get several language constructs which do one thing and do it well, so that it's always clear what you're trying to do. And I will show you those language constructs on examples. We'll see how to provide context in Scala 2, how we used to do it, and in Scala 3, how we will do it. We will try to add some functionality. We'll see how to define type classes, how to define implicit conversions between the types, how, the, how do implicit imports work, what's changed in them, how to behave with unused names, and how compilers, compiler errors are different. So these are the use cases which, in my opinion, are either the most important or most widely used. So let's start by providing context. Generally, in functional programming, it's a common, common practice that you specify a lot of the arguments as parameters to your methods so that you know what your method does. It doesn't just fetch different things from different places. You see everything in the signature of the method. But a side effect of that can be that the parameter lists get very long, and then your code gets cluttered with repetitive things which don't really change, but they have to be specified. So what you can do is you, you can say that some parameter is context for you, and you don't have to specify it every time. For example, in Scala, when you are defining futures, apart from the future body, which is there, you have to somehow tell the compiler what is your execution context. So this is kind of a thread pool on which your future will run. 
but you don't want to specify it every time. If you have 10, 20, 50 features in your scope, you just want to define it once. So what you can do is here in Scala tool, this is the definition of the apply method, which you use to, to construct the future. And you can see that apart from the parameter lister list, which uh, defines the body, it also has an implicit parameter list where you define the executor, so the execution context. And the way you use it is you use an implicit value saying to the compiler, this is the execution context that you need to use. So that's how we used to do it in Scala 2, a very popular idiom. And how is it different in Scala 3 now? You want to use your future the same way, but the definition of the apply method will have a new keyword. So instead of the implicit keyword, we now have the using keyword. So this is telling to the compiler that if you call this method, you want to be use some kind of execution context that you need to provide. Go back. And the way you provide it is you use the given keyword. So this given and using pair is the most important thing, I think, for contextual abstractions in Scala 3, and something you will use it uh, quite often. So let's now talk about adding functionality. And to, the, to explain this, let's see, let's define a sample domain. So let's say we have a website with book reviews, so that people can add books that they have read and add reviews for them. And uh, this is a kind of social media. But also you can specify reading challenges, so that you can say, for example, at the beginning of the year, that you want to read 12 books this year, or 20 books, or 30, and then you add the books you have read, you see if you're on track or not, and see how, they, how your friends uh, do it. And this is all fine, but now it turns out that some of the users add very short books, so that they add books which are five pages long, and then they finish their reading challenges in January, and it's not fun for anyone anymore. So you have a feature request for your product owner saying that you want to say whether a book qualifies for a challenge or not. And it qualifies if it's more than 20 pages long. But the problem is that your book is a closed type. You don't have access to it. You cannot modify it. It's somewhere there in another package, in another library. So what you can do is you can add functionality. This is what we are trying to do here. And in Scala 2, the way you do it is you define an implicit class for it. So you define an implicit class, you give it a name, it operates on type book, and then you add the class, you add the method that you want to define, and the body is whether the number of pages is more than 20. So you have such a code in Scala 2, then you can just call the qualifies for challenge method on books, and then if it qualifies, you get true. This is fine in Scala 2. And let's see now how it's different in Scala 3. You have the same problem. You, the book is still a closed type. And the way you would, we define this new functionality is with a new extension keyword. And this is how it's defined. You specify on which type the extension has to work, and you just add the method and the method body. And this is a good example of a language feature which does one thing and does it well. So from now on, when you see the extension keyword, you can instantly see, even without thinking, that here we are adding functionality, we are adding methods to some closed type. So now, let's talk about type classes. Type classes are a very powerful feature, and it's widely used in functional languages in general, and in Scala as well. So to explain why we might need them, let's imagine that people have said in our reading website that apart from reading books, they also read some articles. Maybe they even read more articles, and they would like it to be part of the challenge as well. But how do you score it? Is one book worth the same as one article? 
Probably not. So let's say we have a feature request saying that each book is scored according to the number of pages it has, but each article is always scored one. Because you don't always know how many pages an article in an online magazine or in a blog has. So we would like to count the score differently for books and differently for articles. And we have our types, book and article, However, they are not related. How can we add behavior to it? If those were two types from a common parent, then we could define the score method on the parent and just let the subtypes define it. However, it's not. So what can we do? This is where type classes come into play. They are a mechanism to specify for you so-called ad hoc polymorphism. So for two unrelated type, you specify one behavior. And the way you do it in Scala 2 is you have a trait, a type class. In our case, it's a scorable parameterized by the type T, and you say that your behavior is the score method. And the way you implement these type classes is, for example, you can use implicit values, but to be honest, you can also use implicit defs or objects so that it's more, more complicated and confusing. But generally, you implement the scorable behavior or interface for your type book. And the implementation provided is here. For the book, it's the number of pages. And in the same way, you, we implement the trait scorable of article, and the implementation is that it's always one. And now, how we need to use those type classes? Let's say we have a current score case class which keeps our current score for us, and we have the add item method on it. And so we want to add the item depending on the type. And the way we specify it is we parameterize by this type T colon scorable, so that's called a context bound in Scala. And we take the item type, we take the current value of the score so far, and this implicitly thing, what it does is it tells to the compiler Dear compiler, please fetch me the implementation of score for this type class on which I was called. This is a way to call the concrete implementation of the subtype. And this way, we can, uh, we can have the code as it is here below. So we can have the book. We have the initial, initial score of zero. We add the item of book. The score is 600, and when we add the item of an article, it invokes the correct implementation of the type class, and the current score is now 601. So this is why we might need type classes in general, to define ad hoc polymorphism. And this is still Scala 2. By the way, there are two ways to do it in Scala 2, and if you don't like this implicitly keyword, then you can also have an implicit parameter list where you will then use it just, you have a named instance of scoring, and then you call the score method on the scoring item. So there are, these are two ways for Scala 2. And you can have similar two ways with Scala 3. However, you define type classes in a different way. We use the given keyword, which we already know, the trait is defined the same way, but to define a type class, we use the given keyword, and then we have a given scorable parameterized by the book type and parameterized by the article type. And the way we use it is here, it's very similar. You still have this T colon scorable context bound, uh, com context bounds, and then instead of the implicitly keyword, we get the summon keyword. So even for this such a simple thing, the implicit keyword or prefix is gone, and it's replaced by summon. But generally, it's the same. And you can also have the other way with the implicit parameter list, and here, as expected, you have the new using keyword. Everything else is the same. So that's how you define type classes in Scala 3. So let's now have a look at conversions. So here we are still in our book domain, and let's say we have books, but we also have the notion of item somewhere in our code. It's also a closed type, but we also have this print item method. 
It's a very special method. It's just a unique way of printing, very, very good. You would like to use it, but it operates on the item type, and you would like to call it on the book type. What can you do? This is where implicit conversions are, are useful. Sometimes you want to tell the compiler, if you see a book but expect an item, just treat the book as an item. And the way we define it in Scala 2 is with implicit conversions using the implicit keyword, defining an implicit dev, this book to item method here, it takes the type book as parameter and returns the item, and the body is just calling the item constructor. So this is cool in Scala 2, but it still uses this implicit keyword, so it's confusing because implicit is used for many different things. What do we get in Scala 3? In Scala 3, we get a separate thing for that. This is the conversion class. So you can give the implementation of the conversion class to your compiler using the given keyword, but it's a specific class defined scala.conversion parameterized by source type and target type, and you have to define this apply method which takes, in our case, book, it returns the item, and this is the body of it. So again, the good thing is now when you see the conversion class parameterized by two types, you know that you are defining an implicit conversions. So you cannot easily confuse it with something else. And then let's say a word about imports. So generally, this, this kind of code would compile in Scala 2. This brings an implicit execution context into context. You maybe you know it, maybe you don't know it, but if you have this line, your code compiles. And in Scala 3, such code won't compile. And this is because this implicit dot asterisk, what it does in Scala 3, is it tells to the compiler, dear compiler, please fetch me everything apart from givens. So only the explicit things. So right now, we don't have the execution context, context imported. If you do want to import it, then you have to use this implicit.given syntax. And what it does is it says, dear compiler, please fetch me all given instances from the scope. So the good thing about it is now, next time you have a long list of imports and you don't know why your copied code doesn't compile in that other class, you can just see the dot given imports and see which one you may be needing, needed in, needing in your new place. And if you did want to import everything from the scope, you can just use this kind of syntax. So given instances and all other instances. This is one of the things that makes Scala 3 easier to understand and easier to work with. The next thing is unused names. So let's say we are still in our books domain and we want to have the books sorted. So for this, we can use the built-in tools in Scala. And for example, if we are working with sequences, that we have the secop straight and the sorted method there parameterized by the type. But to sort the books, you have to tell the compiler what it means, how, how you should order the books, so provide some kind of ordering. And this is, again, a way of providing context. So you don't want to specify this ordering every place where you sort it, you just want to specify it somewhere once. And we already know that we do it with implicit, specifying the ordering on the type of book, and providing the implementation for the two books that, that you want to compile them alphabetically. This is cool, but you can see that this by title name, it's never used in my code because it's an implicit parameter. I don't have to use it. But still, I have to think of a name for it in Scala 2. And it's not like it's a major thing which makes things confusing and so on, but this is just a minor annoyance. You make a lot of decisions in your programming work, and then you also have to make the decision of how to name this variable, which is not even used. The name compiler doesn't need the name. So that, that's, that's another thing that adds some complexity to your day. And in Scala 3, even such a simple thing was fixed. 
And in Scala 3, using the given keyword, we specify the ordering the same way. You can give the name, but you can also omit the name. And this is so-called anonymous givens. So the compiler, it still has everything it needs. So it has the type, it has the implementation. This is enough. And if you want, you can provide the name if you think that it's helpful for your code, if it makes it more readable. But if you don't mind, you can just omit it and it's still fine. So that's just a simple but a very nice thing, in my opinion. And then compiler errors. When you are working with implicits in Scala 2 and you get them wrong, sometimes the compiler isn't so helpful. It's a bit helpful, but not so much. So for example, it tells you what implicit is missing, but not where. And sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. If you have a long chain of method calls, sometimes it's not clear which method ex expects some kind of implicit. And in Scala, through, in Scala 3, the compiler errors get a little bit clearer, because not only do they say what is needed, but it also says where it's needed. So here in this last line, you say for parameter scoring in method add item in class current score. So you have the class name, the method name, and the parameter name. So that's very helpful when trying to sort out your implicit code. But also, sometimes the compiler will, be try, will try to be super helpful. So sometimes it will even suggest the imports that you might be missing. For example, in the case of execu execution context, it can suggest that maybe you're missing implicit.global. And when I was playing with code in Scala 3 and I missed some uh, implicit imports, it felt almost too easy. I missed something, but the compiler says, don't worry, maybe you need that one and you'll be fine. And sometimes it's really right and helpful. So now that we have the seven use cases and the basic building blocks of contextual abstractions in Scala 3, how do we migrate? Because if we are using some libraries and the libraries, maybe they have migrated already, but we still have the implicit code, can we use them together? For the time be being, we can. For the migration period, they can live together. And uh, the the other way around, if you have an old li library which haven't migrated, but your code migrated, you can use them interchangeably. So givens work okay with implicits, implicit parameter list, and using clauses, and so on. They can work together. At least for 3.0 and 3.1 with uh, the compiler flags, we can use them together, and only then, sometime in the future, you will start to get compilation warnings, and then sometime in the future, compilation errors, well, where the implicit keyword won't be allowed to be in your code anymore. So to sum up, in my opinion, this is a very good change in Scala 3, because it makes the developer experience much better. It makes the language, it helps you provide and express your intention more clearly. So it's actually along the functional programming principles, where you don't specify how you want to do it, but you specify what you want to do. And here, with the use of given and using per, the extension method and the conversion class, you have several building blocks which do one thing and do it well, which allow you to make your code expressive. So together with more helpful imports and uh, things like anonymous givens, it just makes writing Scala even more pleasurable than for Scala 2. If you'd like to know more, there's also, you can have a look at context functions. This is also another feature related to contextual abstractions, but I haven't included it here because it doesn't have a direct counterpart in Scala 2. It's a brand new thing. So if you're interested in that, please check it out. And if you'd like to migrate, you can have a look at Scala 3 documentation, which has those uh, concepts that I have explained covered in much more detail. And if you're ready to migrate, the migration guide has 
lots of useful resources, where to start, which tools to use, and so on. If you'd like to see the examples from this presentation, from this presentation, they live in two GitHub repo repositories, one for Scala 2, one for Scala 3. You can run them both, play with them, and see if you like it. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. And if you have any feedback about the presentation, you can scan the QR or go to the link below. It also includes the link to the slides. Thank you. Let's see if there are any questions in Slido. Did companies actually adopt Scala 3? I remember conversations, then Scala 2 and 3 split will damage the community. How did that turn out? Well, I don't know. I don't see the community too damaged right now. As for the actual adoption and production adoption, I would, see, I would say that's still work in progress. I have seen some projects being migrated, but personally, my project is, is not migrated, and it's probably some time in the future until we finally get to do it. Next question. Scala free extension methods. Which import will you need? Why won't you have the same works in another file problem? The import you need is scala.conversion. The reason why you don't have this works in another file problem is that, well, actually, that, that's, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if the given import syntax is helpful here. I will have to have a look at that after the presentation, but uh, it's a good question. But for what, what, what it makes more useful is for sure when you see the implementation of the conversion, then you already see what is being defined. So here it's clear, and in the imports, I would have to think about that. Next question then. Do ex no. Is there any hope for Scala to become, become more popular? I use it only for Spark jobs and I like it. I don't know. I think there's always hope. If we make our job writing good Scala code, being excited about Scala and being a great community, why not? Do extension and given keyword do anything different semantically than implicit? Or are they sort of renames? Well, for the sake of this presentation, it's the same, but actually it's more complicated. And if you do have a look at the, at the Scala Free documentation for Scala Free, there are some subtle or not so subtle things when this change. So it's, it's far more complex for me to cover in this presentation, but if you're interested, please do have a look. The one thing that is one-to-one -one is, for example, this context bounds and implicitly and sum on keyword. This is one-to-one, -one, but given and using, it's more complicated. Is there a migration path for implicits from two to three? So as I say, you can switch on Scala free and still use implicits at first. And then you can, um, you can have a look at, uh, at your implicits and just replace them gradually. You don't have to do it all at once. So I think that that's the answer. Scala free conversion class. Is conversion a Scala free keyword? No, it's not. It's, the, it's only the conversion class. It's the Scala.conversion parameterized by the two types. So for conversions, we don't, we don't get a new keyword. Do you know if there's a way to add suggestions to the compiler errors? For example, in a big organization when they know about common suggestions. I have no idea, but that's a very good idea. It's a, it's a good idea to check it out. I suppose that if you can't do it, then you probably can have some tools of libraries, which you can already do it. If not, maybe it's time to write it. 
Are there any language aspects from Scala 2 that you're going to miss in Scala 3? No. In my, ex in my opinion, no. Because the way I see Scala 3, okay, it does drop some of the features, but none of those that I have used extensively or that I think are very useful. What Scala 3 does for me is just makes programming simpler. And this is, this is very important for me. Is it true that SoftwareMail is hiring Scala developers and more info can be found at the booth? What a great question and probably not asked by any of the SoftwareMail guys here. Yes, it is true. We are hiring, we have a booth and we have a Scala Wheel of Fortune. So it's a great company to work in. Next question then, not sponsored. In Scala 2, sometimes we have more than one implicit and we need to specify one explicitly. How can we do it in Scala 3 if we don't have a name? With the example of ordering. Well, this is a very good question. Even if we don't have a name, the compiler gives it a name. And there are some rules, so you can actually know what kind of a name will be given to this implicit by the compiler. So you can use that. If not, then you just, I guess, want to give the name, if you can, so that it's much more clear. If not, you can see that there are deterministic rules about this name, so you can somehow generate it or just find out what the name is, and then you provide it the name explicitly, you can import it explicitly. So I think that was the last question. Thank you, there were amazing questions. It was a pleasure to talk to you today, and I'll be around at the corridors if you'd like to have a chat as well. Thanks.